Good day learners and welcome as we continue with our exam prep and this time I'm looking at the you can see this is the DBE CAT paper 2 exam this was the June exam from 2022 and this was a paper out of 150 and that you were given around three hours to do that okay so let's go in and have a look and the first thing we're going to see before i even start any of the questions you can see and you can compare this to the previous video i did where i was dealing with the 2021 paper so we've still got three sections section a out of 25 section b out of 75 and then section c out of 50. now the marks can be vary, but generally um, this is the split you'll have in terms of your sections then we can see with this one question one that deals with multiple choice. Question two, again, similar to what we saw in 2021, match the item. So I hope you are starting to see a pattern. Question three, some true and false, and that rounds off section A. Then section B, system technologies again. Que uh, yeah, question five, internet and network technologies. We're still in question, uh, section B. Question six, information management, and question seven, social implications. Um, and then question eight, solution development, and that rounds off section B. Okay, so that's that sorted out. And then section C is usually just one massive 50 mark um, question on an integrated scenario. So we're taking everything we've learned um, and applying it to a particular scenario okay so that's the basic structure and let's now get into question number one so question number one we are now looking at multiple choice we have 10 of them so let's get started let me just zoom in here okay so question 1.1 a user may suffer from what when spending a lot of time at the computer so again when they're spending a lot of time at the computer and we are working for hours on end, even think of um, playing games for hours on end. What do you see happening or what do you feel happening? Well, usually you'll have some issues in, in your hands, your back, your things like that. What does that relate to? That relates to this particular item here called RSI. What does that stand for? Repetitive strain injury. Picking up injuries from doing the same things over and over, from spending a lot of time at the computer. Right? So you can see I don't even have to look at the others. Just from understanding what the question is asking of me. 1.2. Which one of the following is most likely to be the size of a data bundle bought by a user? So, again, stop and think there. How much data do you buy? Or when you buy data, what are you talking about it in terms of you know, size? Do we talk about megs? Like I'm just going to buy 50 megs? No, some of us talk about like buying 250 megs, 500 megs. These days we talk <laughs> much bigger terms than that. We talk about, you know, hundreds of gigs or, uh, sorry, hundreds of megs or gigs. I'm going to buy 2.5 gigs. I'm going to buy one gig. So, again, I haven't looked at the answers. I'm just looking at the question. One meg. I mean, seriously, is anyone going to buy one meg? You can just about open your browser with that. 100 kilobytes. Now, we know kilobytes are smaller than megs, so no. 5 terabytes, you must be out of your mind. That is way too much. Remember, 1,024 gigs makes up 1 terabyte. So, 5 terabytes, no. 1 gig is the most obvious and most logical answer there. Right. 1.3a, what could be used to input data? So, giving instructions instead of using the number keys on a keyboard. So, instead of typing in things on your number pad, right? Instead of using those number keys, what can we use to give instructions to the PC? Can we use a barcode scanner? What does a barcode scanner do? When I scan those barcodes, it does what? It gives that information to the PC, and the PC then gives us um, output. A touchpad, what is a touchpad used for? Well, on our laptops, it's used as a mouse. Can it be used to input data? Hmm, no. The joystick, I can give instructions, but can I input data, for example, on a 
um, you know, into a spreadsheet or things like that. No, I can't. The game controller, same story, no. So by process of elimination, what am I going to use? The barcode scanner. Now you might say, yeah, but sir, maybe that barcode scanner can't really be much of an option. Think about what happens at the toll point. You hardly see them typing anything. What are they doing? They're scanning the barcodes. And what is it doing? It's adding all of those things up. Not just reading it, but adding all of those things up together. Okay. Then 1.4. Which one of the following is not? Not, in capitals, an example of biometric, of a biometric input device. What is biometrics? We're using our body as a means of security. So I'm going to use my fingerprint, my eyes, you know, all of these type of things. And they're asking us to give one that is not an example of that. Well, a fingerprint reader, that is biometric input, right? Um, do you think a microphone is biometric input? What do we do with a microphone? We speak over the microphone. So we're going to use our voice. Is that part of your biology? Yes, it is. Um, what about a touchpad? Remember, the touchpad is a mouse. No. So that is a potential option. And the camera, what does the camera do? Well, it's going to give a picture of who I am, maybe my face and things like that. Is that part of biometrics? Yes, it is. So again, just by trying to, and I, and I hope you, you, are, you are starting to see how I approach this and how you should be approaching this. You want to read the question. You want to see if there are certain um, hints that are left in there. When you look at certain terms, what does that mean? What are they asking of you? And then we go to the answers. And so our answer here is C. Right, 1.5. Here we have a screenshot. They say study the screenshot. So this is an Excel spreadsheet. I can see the cell I'm in is cell D2. I can see an if statement. Now let's just see if the, I'm not even going to this. I just want to see if the if statement is correct. Equals if open bracket. My criteria is if whatever is in C2 is greater than or equal to 30. It must display the word pass. If it doesn't match that criteria, it must display the word fail. So that all looks okay. Which one of the following options would display the correct result for cell D2? Now, greater than or equal to 30. So is this mark greater than or equal to 30? Um, it is. So it should display pass. Look at C. Can it display that? What is that? That's displaying a blank a space. Can it do that? No, because it's not even in this over here. Can it display 30? No, because that's not part of this, um, of the results for matching or failing the or failing to match the, the criteria. So that's not even there. And can it display fail? No, it can't because the number is greater than 30. So it's going to display pass. Do you see how I did that again? 1.6 and 1.7 and... Yeah, let's one, go 1 1.8. Which one of the following functions is used in a database but not in a spreadsheet? So this formula here, len, that gives me the length of the characters in a particular string. Um, ah, ah, do you see that? What is that? That's average. Immediately I notice that average is not spelled correctly. Now I can't use this in Excel because I've got to type out the whole word average. Can I use max in Excel? Yes. Len? Yes. Count? Yes. Hmm. Which is the odd one out? It's B. Not in a spreadsheet. So I can use AVG or for average in a database, but not in a spreadsheet. 1.7. In a word processor. So we're talking about Word, right? Word, notepad, wordpad, all those type of things. The what fixes misspelled words without user input. Hmm. Think about your phone. You type in on your phone and it automatically corrects things for you. Have you already got the answer? It's not the thesaurus. It's not the find and replace. It's not spelling and grammar. They're talking about it fixes spell misspelled words without you having to do anything. That is autocorrect. And again, just think of your phones, right? It's something we usually turn off when we get a new phone. <laughs> okay. Right, let's move on. Um, 1.8. This type of file contains data which is most likely separated by commas. That already tells me what it is. That already tells me. Okay? It contains data separated by commas. 
A Word document? No. An Excel spreadsheet? No. A PowerPoint presentation? No. That is a CSV document, right? In the name CSV, the, the CS is for your comma separated values. Okay, so it's already there, guys. All right. Uh, so that's a 1.9. Which one of the following is the fastest option for permanent storage? Now, what is meant by permanent storage in a computer? That means that when I switch the PC off and I switch it back on, my data is still there. My files, my folders, everything is still there. So they're talking now about the fastest option, right? The fastest option. When it comes to DVDs, what do I need to do? I need to take the disc. I need to put it in. It needs to read the disc. That is not that fast. Right, ROM. Those instructions have already been loaded, but you know, um, when I switch on the PC, ROM already loads, so that's not there. Well, that's that's not an option. What about cache? What does cache do? Right, we we think of cache when it comes to our websites to help them load quicker. Um, is that permanently stored? No. So our permanent storage, talking about our hard drive of these, it is going to be the fastest option. And then lastly finish off our multiple choice a point of sale system so think of your cash registers think of your 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 toll points um, in the shops it is typically linked to what do you think it would be linked to a spreadsheet would it be linked to a database a text file or a jpeg now jpeg we're dealing with pictures so it's not going to be linked to that a text file i mean we're talking about things like notepad or you know wordpad you think it's going to be linked to that no um, why would I possibly have it linked to a database? Because in my database, I can have a massive amount of data that's actually going through there. From there, I can pull queries, reports, all those type of things. Um, so that is the best option out of these. For my spreadsheet, I can't do in Excel what I can do in Access. So um, if you look at the, the education department, they use the SA SAMS, uh, system which is based off of an access database because it can be fairly large okay so there we go it is b right let's now move over to question two now question two again something we've seen before we're talking about match the items now and i'm just going to zoom out on that and here we can see our definitions again we've got 10 definitions but we've got far more than 10 terms over here um, and again, the first thing you want to do is just have a look through, okay, RAM, LTE, word processing. We're looking for anything that sort of stands out that we might not understand. Resolution, WAN, shaping, when it comes to our internet, that's our uh, internet speed as well. Disk cleanup, that's fine. Sum, this is this is Excel. This is Excel. Um, spam, unsolicited email, okay, a keyboard, phishing, phishing and farming. So we're talking about malware, scams, that type of thing. Our network, um, yeah, you know, Skype, WhatsApp, WhatsApp call, our Explorer, our Adware again, Malware, um, our spreadsheet, brightness, and Bluetooth. Okay, so nothing out of the ordinary there. Nothing that's really going to confuse us just in terms of understanding the terms. So let's see what they want. First one, 2.1. A program that enables a user to organize his or her files and folders. Now, on the PC, how do we do this? How do we do this? We do it by using the Explorer. Over here, when I open this, there's my file Explorer. Okay, so that's our option. The first one is P. Then 2.2, an application most suited for data analysis. So it's not going to be Word. Remember, we're talking about an application. So we're looking at a program. So we're going through, going through going through and the only other one that we have is our spreadsheet right excel 2.3 software so again a program that attempts to collect information about the user without their permission so it's sort of spying on us do we have an option like that yes spyware okay right 2.4 can can you see how quickly i'm, I'm going through this a spreadsheet function that extracts text data. Okay, so we know it's in Excel. Now, do we have anything for Excel? Uh, we've got sum. We've got mid. That's all we've got. Okay, so what does sum do? Sum adds up things, right? 
when I say the sum of this particular cell range, it'll add up all those things. So immediately that's not the option. So already I know that out of these two, it's going to be mid. Okay. And what mid is going to do, what do they tell us here? It extracts text data. So it looks at a particular cell and it pulls out the characters that I need it to. Okay. So that's K. 2.5, a standard used in wireless communication that provides high-speed data transfers. Okay, let's go to our options. We're talking about wireless communication. LTE have something to do with that? Yes, it does. Let's go through this. And there's nothing else that actually has to do with that. So, where are we again? 2.5, a standard used in wireless communication that provides high-speed data transfers and again there we go it is LTE folks I hope you are seeing how I approach these questions I haven't seen this paper before I've never worked through this paper um, but this is how I approach these things right 2.6 certain internet services are given bandwidth preference here we go what does that mean bandwidth preference it means that your, your internet service provider is maybe at certain times allowing more speed to go with downloads or more speed to go with browsing as opposed to... So in other words, the internet service provider is doing something to your bandwidth, to your internet line. Um, when they give preference to certain services, they are actually shaping that line. Right. And that's F, shaping. 2.7. An important consideration when purchasing a monitor. Mm, what do you consider? Do you consider Bluetooth the brightness? No, we don't worry about the brightness because we can adjust it. So we go through nothing, 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 nothing. There's one term. There we go. There we go. The resolution. What does the resolution mean? It's the quality of the image. Okay. That is extremely important. 2.8. A hardware component that will improve the performance of a computer. Hardware, physical hardware, right? None of this, none of that. And look, as you do this, just scratch out what you've already used so you know what you um, are left with. The land, the keyboard, does the keyboard improve the performance of a computer? No. What is it going to be? Ah, there we go. A, it is RAM. Beautiful. And 2.9, a type of network that connects offices of a company that are located, here's your key, in different cities. That means in different geographical areas. Do you already know the, the answer? Yes, it is WAN, a wide area network. And then 2.10, our last one for this uh, question, unwanted, do you remember I said this when I started? Unwanted or unsolicited emails sent to a large number of users, that is spam, 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 spam. There we go. It is J. It is spam. So question number three deals with true and false items. So let's just have a look at this. It's just five questions and then we are done with section A. Now again, when you deal with true or false, you need to say whether something is true and that'll give you one mark. And then you need to indicate whether something is false, but also replace the underlined word in order to make the statement true. So you can't just say false. You won't get a mark for that. It's got to be false and what the word should be in order to make it true. So yeah, they give us an example, but let's start with 3.1. So 3.1 says HDMI cables transfer. Okay, let's just stop there. What does HDMI cables do? They transfer video and audio. That's why we use that one cable instead of multiple cables to get video and audio. Now we read the statement. HDMI cables transfer only video signals. We know that's false. We know that's false. So we're going to indicate false and then what do we replace this with? We can replace it with VGA or DVI but just stick with VGA. It's, it's, it's a lot simpler to remember. Remember our VGA cables transfer video only. Okay. 3.2, NFC, near field communication. You know the fact that you can use your, your bank card and just tap um, or just be near the machine and you know the transaction will go through? That's near field communication. It requires devices to be very close together. 
What does the name say? Near field communication. These devices have to be near one another. What's the saying? They have to be very close to one another for data transfer. Yes, that is true. 3.3 data transfer speed in a Wi-Fi network could be improved if physical obstructions are removed. Now that is going to be true because with a Wi-Fi network, because they are you know, using sig uh, signals that we can't even see physically, um, things like walls, doors, um, physical objects, they can get in the way and interfere with the signal that we are getting. Okay, so that is true. Let's look at the next one, grid computing. Now, what is grid computing? Remember, when we are using the resources of multiple computers to accomplish a particular task, that's when we're dealing with grid computing. So, knowing that, let's look at the rest. It enables computers to perform intellectual tasks, such as decision-making and problem-solving. Um, intellectual tasks. That means this thing's actually got to be thinking about this. doesn't sound right. That's not grid computing. Remember, I just looked at the term. I first think of what the term means. The rest does not line up. So I'm going to say false. And why? Because if we're talking about intellectual tasks such as decision making, so you are asking this thing to make a decision. No, that sounds like going to chat GPT. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're talking about artificial intelligence. So we're going to say false. We can say AI or write out artificial intelligence. And then the last one, cryptocurrencies um, a cryptocurrency we know we're talking about a digital currency here so here they mentioned these digital currencies are very large data sets that are analyzed to reveal to reveal trends no 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 we're talking about um, a digital currency a digital form of money um, now they're saying they are very large sets of data that are analyzed to reveal trends no so that is false that is by definition, it is big data, okay? So big data are large data sets that are analyzed to reveal trends. And folks, that is it for section A of this June paper. Now we move on to section B, and we know here we have four questions, so it is a large section. I think it's 75 marks, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. It is the biggest section, so you do want to spend some time going through that. And we're dealing with system technologies in question number four. So you can see just from the questions, we're dealing with the hard drives, the users, the UPS, virtual keyboards, things like that. So you can see what we are talking about when it comes to system technologies. Okay, so let's kick it off with 4.1. And they mentioned to us here, and I don't want you to get confused with this, always look at the mark allocation people. Please look at the mark allocation. So, for example, they are saying to us, 4.1, discuss the concept of communication in the information processing cycle. Do you think I need an entire paragraph for one mark? No, I don't. All you need to tell me there is, well, what is communication? It is the result of processing that we are sharing. Remember, with our information processing cycle, we've done the input, we've done the processing, we've got the output. Now, when we share that output, that is communication. So, you can say sharing the output with other people, sharing the results of output with others. Any of that will do for 4.1. Then 4.2 says, give one reason why a hard disk drive, so a traditional hard drive, is not preferred in a laptop. Now, remember our traditional hard drives, um, and I just want to maybe get something here so we can have a look. Um, our traditional hard drive versus what we have in our solid state drives, and I want you just to remember that. Um, we know that there is a, a difference between those two. So let me just open up and get a nice picture here so we can see for ourselves. Um, remember our hard drives? Here we go. Look at that. Our hard drive has moving parts. Our solid state drives do not. These are slower. These are faster. These, if we knock them around, they're going to get damaged. Our SSDs, not so much. Think of your SSD drive like the one in your phone. Okay, how many times have you dropped your phone, but your phone is still working? All right. So one reason why the hard disk drive is not preferred 
in our laptops, well, they are easily damaged, they are heavier, and it uses more electricity. Okay, so I'm, I'm giving you three reasons now. <laughs> All right, 4.3, you wish to set up a small office home office. So we're talking about our small office home office user. This is someone who's going to have an entry level PC, they're doing some accounts, they're doing a bit of printing, things like that. And they're going to have four computers. So think about that now. Right? These are going to be entry-level computers. They'll probably have a router, a printer, so they're going to share some internet, share the printer, things like that. Okay. 4.3.1. Explain two criteria that could be used to select a printer for this office. Well, we first need to think of um, how many pages are we printing per month? Uh, how long do we need to keep the printer for? What sort of speed? What sort of quality? Do you, do you see how many things I've pulled out? Right? So we can look at paper, we can look at the fact that we want color or black and white, how fast do we want the printer to print, any of those things. 4.3.2 then builds, remember all of this is building on 4.3. Right? What type of software license would you prefer when installing an Office Suite for this particular office? So Office Suite, we're talking about Microsoft Office, something like that, that has you know Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all of these things. So what type of software license um, should we go for? Well, there is the site license. Now, remember your site license, and I'm actually going to, I think, like I do normally, it's sometimes easier to throw up the memo for you to see. Have a look at this. There you can see you've got different options and the motivation. So a site license, remember a site license is for multiple computers in one area, and you can install the software as many times as you want to. Now, if you don't have an intention of upgrading, if um, you are not worried about how many PCs it's on and you just have in one PC with it, then the site license might not be for you. There's the subscription license. Why would you go for that? Well, you get the latest features and updates are always available. You could go for a multi-user license. That's intended for multiple users irrespective of the number of computers, right? So you needed then to choose of those or to say, you know, which sort of license would be best, but then you would have to motivate why. For me, I would probably, if you're talking about those, those four computers, I'd probably end up going with a site license, which is a little bit more expensive, but it means that on that property or within that particular area of my office, I can install that software as many times as I want to or need to. Okay. In 4.3.3, give two benefits of buying a UPS. What is a UPS? An uninterrupted power supply. Now, what does that do? It plugs into the wall, and it's basically a little battery. So when you plug your PC into that, it means that when the power goes off, your PCs are still running. So that's the first big key. It gives you backup power, but it's only for a limited time. It gives you then the ability to safely shut down your computers. It allows time to save my work before shutting down. So that's the real purpose behind having a UPS. Right, 4.3.4. Which problem could arise if the printer purchased for this office is not set as the default? Now, what does that mean? When I set the office printer as the default, it means that whenever I click print, that is where the document or item is going to go to in order to be printed. If I don't set that printer as the default, what's going to happen? It's going to go somewhere else. It's probably going to go to a wrong printer. It's probably not even going to print. Okay, so that is what will happen. 4.4 says give two disadvantages of open source software. Again, guys, what is open source software? Do you, do you see what I'm doing every single time I look at a question? I want to try and break this down and see if I understand what the question or the statement is um, before I actually answer it. So open source software or OSS. This is software that is free to download, use, distribute and edit. Okay, so I can edit the actual source code of this. Now, while that all sounds good, just remember with software like this, because I can mess with the, the actual code, there's not going to be regular updates. There's no official support. 
there's going to be a lack of help features as well. Okay, so those are just three, um, and they only wanted two of those disadvantages. All right, 4.5, what do they say to us? Explain why a user would prefer using a virtual keyboard rather than a physical keyboard. Now, when we think of our virtual keyboards, um, just think of the fact that they would end up using less physical desk space if we were to use a virtual keyboard. It improves portability of the device. So if we look at our cell phones, our cell phones are using virtual keyboards. It takes up, it doesn't take up any desk space, number one. If we look at how we use our phones, yes, it takes up some screen space, but when we're done with it, it disappears. So it improves the portability of a device. You can customize the keyboard, as many of you probably have, um, and it's nice and clean. You don't have to worry about, you know, getting sticky keys from the physical stuff. So any one of those would have... Um, sufficed. Right, 4.6. It is good practice to make backups. What is a backup? This is when we are making a copy of our data, preferably to a different location. Okay, so 4.6.1, give two reasons why it is important to make offline backups. Why would that even be important? Um, well, we do this so that we can still access that info when there's no internet available. Um, it's faster when it comes to restoring. I don't have to rely on any third party online you know, places for, for my data security. When we talk about offline, we're talking about off the internet, we're talking about away from this actual PC as well. Point two, why should you never make an offline backup of your work on the same device as the original work. Well, if you are just um, going to make a backup on the PC itself, what if that whole PC crashes? Then your original data and your backup is gone. This is why we always back up to a different location, to an external hard drive, to a flash drive, to an online you know, service, whatever it's going to be. Then they want us, lastly, to name a file extension, which is typically associated with backup file sizes that were reduced okay now they're giving us two clues the first one is name a file extension which is typically associated with a backup file size so we know we're going to be talking about megs and possibly gigs and then they mentioned that were reduced so if i've got file sizes five 500 600 700 megs four gigs five gigs and i want to reduce that how do i do that i zip that file I can use things like WinRAR. I can use various pieces of software basically to compress it. So the typical one would be .zip or you could use .rar or whatever extension associated with some sort of compression software. Okay. 4.7. What change must be made to the resolution of a monitor to assist a visually impaired... Ooh. <laughs> you, you, guys, you guys know how upset I'm going to get here. Visually impaired users... The user is not blind. They are not blind. They are visually impaired. They've got glasses. They maybe need the brightness turned up. They maybe need a larger monitor, but they are not blind. Okay? So what resolution, um, sorry, what change could be made to the resolution of a monitor? Well, maybe the resolution needs to be decreased so that the display can actually appear larger. You know, if I'm visually impaired and somebody's going to do this, can I read that a little better? Oh, yes, I can. The resolution is decreased, but the size is going to be um, much better for me. Okay, so what can I do? I can decrease the resolution. What's that going to do? It's going to make the display appear larger. Okay, 4.8. What is the task manager most commonly used for? Um, I wonder if I can bring it up here. So there's my task manager. What is it used for? Well, I can click on any one of these tasks and I can end it. I can basically force programs to shut down if they are not responding, if they are not working properly. Okay, that's really what it's commonly used for. 4.9, give two reasons why it is not recommended that an accountant 
uses a trial version of financial software. Well, remember what a trial version is. It allows me to download it. It allows me to use it, but then only for a limited time before I need to pay for it. So when that trial expires, I mean, think of that, that accountant does all your books. And then the trial expires and the company says they're not going to be paying or, or you decide you're not going to pay. Um, it means you might end up losing all of that data when that trial expires. What about the fact that you won't get certain features because you need to upgrade to the full version? Um, you won't be able to upgrade that software because you first need to buy it. And if you're not careful with this stuff, um, as a result of that, you can actually lose income in the business because now you can't get to your books or your details or anything and you've got to redo everything. Yeah, um, you don't also want to be caught out with very expensive software um, that could cost the company money. Right, the last three questions to round off question number four. 4.10 suggests two ways to resolve the problem of a mouse that does not work properly other than replacing the mouse. Okay, now your mouse is usually connected to your PC via a USB port. So other than replacing the mouse, I can take the cable out. I can plug it into a different port. Perhaps I can plug it into a different PC. Maybe I will restart the PC. Maybe I will check the sensor at the bottom of the mouse you know, to see that it's okay. Maybe reinstall the, the uh, drivers. So there are a number of things I can do besides replacing the mouse. Then 4.11, name two kinds of information found in the metadata of a file. So metadata, here we go. Here we go, metadata. This is the data of the data. And there you can see the different kinds of metadata. The author, the date, time it was created, the geographic location, the file size, the revision number, the attributes, the number of pages, valid descriptive data related to a video or audio file. So all of these, this is all examples of metadata. Okay, and then to round of question four, discuss the purpose of a QR code. Again, please check the mark allocation so you don't give us too much info, right? Just enough to get that mark. So with a QR, it's basically quick access to information quick access because you have the, the QR code up here and when somebody scans it, it'll usually take them to, you know, like a website. Maybe it's got information in it. Maybe it's got videos in it, whatever the case is. But it's basically quick access or a quick link to information. And that rounds off our 25 marks um, for the first part of section B. So this is just question So question five, you can see we are dealing now with the internet and network technologies. It's about 15 marks. So not too much, but you can imagine now we're now into our networks. Okay. So first thing they want us to do is to name a type of internet connection you would recommend for a school and you need to motivate your answer. Now, some of you might say, and again, it is going to depend on what your experience is. You might be in a rural school. And for you, fiber is not going to work because it's too far. You might say, well, um, the type of connection we would want is maybe a satellite connection because it can work in rural areas. It's got high speed. Maybe you want to say, well, um, I'm going to go with cellular because it can also work in those areas. Um, wireless might not. Fiber might not. But for some of you, you might be in urban areas where fiber and ADSL work perfectly. Okay, so you can give any one of those answers, fiber, satellite, ADSL, cellular, but then you just have to motivate why. And again, one mark for the type of connection and one mark for the motivation, the reason why you are saying that. 5.2, um, what is the advantage of using the HTTPS protocol over the HTTP protocol? You would have seen this on some websites, they go HTTPS as opposed to HTTP. And this just simply means it is a more secure protocol. That's what the S stands for, security. So all you're going to say here is it indicates that the website is secure. That's it. 5.3, suggest two ways in which software can be used to protect a network from unauthorized users. Well, you can do a number of things. You can set up a firewall, right? Our antivirus software, 
Um, most of it has firewall capability built in, so it will act as a firewall. Um, you can encrypt your data, or you can just set up rights and logins for authorized users. Those, those are just some of the ways um, in which you can use software to protect your network. The fact that when most of you come into a computer lab and you're logging with the username and password, that is the whole process of setting up rights and logins for users to authorize you to be able to work on the network. 5.4, give two reasons why some users prefer to listen to a podcast rather than read text. Well, this is again going to be a matter of opinion. Uh, many of you are going to give different answers. Um, it might be that, you know what, I prefer listening than reading. Maybe I want to listen because I want to learn how to pronounce certain words. Maybe I can control the listening speed. I know on, on WhatsApp now when you're listening to a voice note, you can double the speed, right? Um, you might, like I said, you might just be a, an, an audio learner, one that learns better through audio than by reading. Um, what about visually impaired learners? What about visually impaired folks? What about blind people, right? So there, there are a number of um, reasons that, that you could use there. All right, 5.5, a particular router has only four network cable ports. Okay, so we're talking about our nice big router at home. It's got four ports at the back. State two ways to connect more than four devices to this router. Well, I can connect wirelessly to it. That's, that's the first one. Okay. Secondly, what about um, adding a wireless access point? Let me actually get you uh, two pictures here. Let's go for a wireless access point while I'm on this. And here you can see these are wireless access points. And then we're also going to look at maybe adding a switch. We can add a switch to that. Right? There we go. That is what our switches look like. Um, and if we add that into our onto our router, it means that we have a number of extra, uh, quite a number of extra ports. You see there, if I just put a cable from my router into this, it gives me all these ports over here. Um, so yeah, those are the options that I have. Give two reasons why internet access is important to users of computing devices. Why is internet access important? Because, and again, it's it's open to your to your opinion. I search inf I search for information. I do e-learning. I you know use it for YouTube. Um, I use internet services you know, for financial things. Maybe you're doing internet banking, cloud computing. Um, you know, collaboration online with people. Maybe you work from home. Any of those things will do. Then as we bring this question to a close, discuss two advantages of using a VPN. Now, what is a VPN? It stands for Virtual Private Network. And when you use a VPN, and I know a lot of you use it for um, when it comes to like streaming and things like that. Sometimes you can't get into a streaming service and then you've got to use a VPN to actually mask your address online and get into that particular thing. So um, this is going to be a service that actually masks your identity online so you can get into other um, services. Now, two advantages is you end up having a more secure connection to a network. You can change your graphic, your geographic location. Okay. Um, and again, like I said to you, it provides pri privacy by masking your IP address. So those are the advantages of using a VPN. A lot of people use it especially for the geographic location because some sites don't want you to stream because of where you are located so people use VPNs to get through. Okay, not advocating that. <laughs> Just say. It. Right, last one for question 5. You cannot connect to the computer network in your classroom. Suggest two possible ways to resolve this problem. Well, you're sitting at your PC, you can't connect to the network. Check the network cable. Check that the network cable is plugged in. Um, you want to check that your PC is switched on. Yeah, I didn't say that loud enough. <laughs> is your PC switched on? Have you restarted the PC? Check that you're logged in correctly. Um, check the network cable. Is it plugged in? Maybe you need to log out and log back in. 
Maybe you need to check the power supply on, on devices. Maybe with like your phone, um, check that your data is on. Check that airplane mode is off. You know, all those type of things. Um, but those are all the options that you can use. And that's question five. Now we move on to question number six, information management. This is a nice one because they take the practical, um, some of the practical sections in your textbook, bring it into, um, you know, theory type questions. We also look at things that we would have done in the pet. Yes, the pet. Um, and they bring it in here as well. And you can see here we're dealing with questionnaires, we're dealing with an extract. Um, there's a pet, there's a pie chart, line chart. Okay, <laughs> so let's let's get going on that. Question number six, six point one. Complete the table below by indicating whether each question is suitable or unsuitable to be used in a questionnaire and give a motivation. So you've got to fill this in. So question one, what are the benefits of cloud computing? Is this a suitable type of question or an unsuitable question? Right? We are using this in a questionnaire. A questionnaire you are giving out to people and you want simple, clear-cut questions so that you can get simple, clear-cut answers as well. So would this be suitable? No, because you are now assuming people even know what cloud computing is. So it's not suit suitable or unsuitable. And it's too open-ended, right? Um, it's really, it's, it's, it's not going to work for a questionnaire. What about question number two? Do you store your data in the cloud? It's a simple yes or no, right? Yes or no. So it is suitable and it's motivation. Um, you can say, well, there's only going to be two possible answers. Yes or no. That's it. Did they say copy only columns one, three, and four in the answer book? Okay, so that's with you writing that out. Then they mentioned 6.2. Study the extract below and answer the questions that follow. So we've got a letter here, um, Cape Town University Press. Um, Elon Musk rocket is about to crash into the moon. Okay, blah, blah, blah. We've got dates updated. Uh, Four-tone chunk of SpaceX on a collision. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, they ask us here, what makes, this is 6.2.1, what makes Harry Petit a trusted or a trustworthy source? Now, here we see Harry Petit, the Deputy Technology and Science Editor. Okay, um, what makes that a trustworthy source? Well, because the author or the editor, whichever term you are going to be using, is associated with a renowned university, Cape Town University Press. Okay, so we can see the author is working there and the role that particular author has at that university. All right, 6.2.2, how do you or how would you check if the information above is actually accurate? Well, whatever source they give you, you are going to check that. You are going to verify that maybe with other websites or with, with the other sources. Or you could ask an expert in this field regarding this, right? Those are just two ways that you can check if the information is actually accurate. Right. Oh, we're almost done with question six again. Which two word processing features, so we are in Word, can be used to reference a source in a document. Hmm. Where am I now? Word. 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 References. What do they say? Which two word processing features can be used to reference a source in a document? References tab. What do you see there? I've got citations. I've got a bibliography. I've got captions. I've got footnotes. All of these can be used to reference a source. Right. Then lastly, 6.4. You gather data from various sources when you did your PET. You wish to use graphs to display your data analysis in the report. There we've got our pie chart, we've got a line graph, we've got a bar chart. And they ask us 
why would we use a pie chart? Well, we can see all the portions of the whole. When the total number is 100%, the pie chart is good because then we can say 25% of that, 8% of that, 10% of that. So that would represent like 100% of whatever it is we are doing. Um, you may use it when there are only a few categories or not too many categories to understand. Can you see how much information is in the line graph as opposed to the pie chart? Right? Then, for that matter, moving on to the next one, 6.4.2, give me one reason for using the line chart. So, why would I use this type of chart? Well, if you look at this, you can see it actually, if I go 2000, 2005, I can see a trend taking place. So, it allows me to see trends, it allows me to see changes over time. Um, it's used when the order of categories are important and when there are many data points, as you can see. Okay, so that should help you then understand that. And that gives me my 10 marks for question 6. Then we move on to question 7, social implications. So we're looking at this now in the real world. We've seen what's going to happen uh, when we implement ICT there. So 7.1, you can see this is just 10 marks. 7.1, give an example of a product that is considered to be intellectual property. Property that somebody owns. And when we talk about intellectual property, this could be an idea. It could be a product. It could be software. It could be music, anything like that. So an example of a product, well, it could be music. It could be software. It could be art. It could be books. It could be a design. It could be a podcast. Any of those things. 7.2, give two guidelines that can be found in... Uh, a school's BY, what is this BYOD? Bring your own device. What guidelines can we have in a school's BYOD policy? Well, install antivirus. Use the appropriate software, legal software. Limit the data usage. Um, the school has the right to install software on it. School information should be encrypted. The school, you know, doesn't accept liability for loss. So if you lose it, it's nice that you can bring it, but if you lose it, it's on you. If you get a virus, it's on you. Um, the school has the right to, to allow it to connect to the network or not connect to the network, right? Any any of those um, you can use. And again, you can use your, your creativity. 7.3, suggest two ways in which to prevent computer hardware theft in schools. Okay, so we can install in our maybe computer lab. It's, it's a question that comes up regularly, people. So... We can have security gates and burglar bars. We can maybe pop in a um, an alarm system. We can put in security cameras. We can put in biometric security. We can take our devices when we are done and put them into a safe. Um, we can secure them, the, the computers, the uh, system units, to the floor. You know, we can chain things down, all these type of stuff. We can use RFID tags, anything like that. Okay? So that's to prevent... Hardware theft. Remember, hardware theft sealing the physical hardware. 7.4, explain two ways to protect your privacy when using the internet through a public hotspot. So you are at a restaurant or you are in a mall and you are um, connecting there. How do you actually um, protect your privacy? Well, you don't use public hotspots and public internet cafes and things like that to perform financial transactions. You don't do your internet banking like that. You don't give out personal information. You don't log into apps that have maybe sensitive information. You could use a VPN, as we mentioned earlier, right? Any of those. Then 7.5, give one reason why some companies may not allow their employees to telecommute. And that could be very simple. And I'm going to give you these reasons so you can see for yourself. The security of sensitive information cannot easily measure their performance or productivity when they are not in the office. Too many distractions at home. Costly to set up a work infrastructure. Resources at the office and at the homes of employees. The job description requires their physical presence. And it can eliminate professional isolation or encourages teamwork. So there are a number of reasons why Certain companies don't want to do this working from home business. 
or working online and things like that. They just, yeah, it all, it's always going to depend on the particular industry. Although, yeah, COVID showed us anything is possible. Right, 7.6, discuss two negative effects a user can experience if he or she over, oh, here we go, overuses, oh no, overuses social media. Look, most of you use, overuse social media. Okay, <laughs> that's just, any young person is um, <laughs> probably 95% of the time overusing social media. You're using it too much. I mean, you're using it when you're in class, <laughs> we know. Um, you're using it when you are on your way home, at home, in the toilet, all these different things. So what are two of the negative effects associated with that? Well, one thing that they've always made fun of um, this generation for is the lack of social interaction. You've got five people sitting around a table and everybody's looking at a screen. You can become addicted to social media. Now, you know that when the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is check your social media. Before you go down on your knees and pray, uh, the first thing you're doing is actually checking your social media. Then you are becoming an addict. Um, this addictive behavior can lead to depression when things are not going so well online. Um, with some, it can lead to effects, well, negative effects when it comes to self-esteem. Because now you're worried about how people view you online. Right, and then the last one for 15 marks is question eight, your solution development. Okay, let's let's have a look at this. So, again, some prac uh, questions that are going to be asked. And here we go. 8.1, what is the purpose of using a bookmark in a word processing document? Well, what does it do? It quickly links, links us to different locations in the document. That's the purpose of the bookmark. 8.2, how would you prepare the headings in a word processing document to appear in an automatic table of contents? Well, we know in order to get it in an automatic table of contents, what do we need to do? We need to format it as, an, as a heading. So we need to apply a style to the heading. Okay, 8.3, we need to study the following database table. There we've got our fields, we've got our data types, we've got our descriptions. That's fine. So all of these questions are going to relate to this. Suggest an appropriate size for the S name field. What is that? That's supposed to be like for your first name, right? Uh, your surname. Now, they're asking us to suggest an appropriate size. Remember when we go into the properties, then they ask us for the field size. So what sort of size do you think the first name should be? Well, probably anywhere between maybe two characters and 50 characters it is sort of open because we're dealing with people's names. Different cultures have different names. And some of those names can be fairly long. Um, some people might have double battled first names, you know, or things like that. So use your discretion there. 8.3.2, which field would be appropriate to use as a primary key? What is a primary key? It's the most unique item there. The most unique item is supposed to be your ID, right? Nobody else has your ID number, or at least they shouldn't have. 8.3.3, which data type could be used for the gender field to select an appropriate option? Now, if we're going to go gender, we want to make sure that they're choosing, you know, male or female. So are we going to use short text? We can use that. What are they saying? Which data type could be used for that? Hmm. Think now. Think now. Do we want short text? What do we, what do we want? We actually want them to choose. So... We can use either, you know, yes or no, or we can still use short text, but use it, well, it'll display as short text, but we can use the um, lookup wizard and then pop in the options that they can choose. So it becomes like a combo box. And then 8.3.4, which field property of the school field would automatically insert data in that field? That, I'm just off the top of my head, that is our default value. That's what displays um, regardless of what I put into the other fields. Right, 8.4. A database contains several URLs. How would you be able to display all the records of the URLs ending in .com in a database query? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. How are we going to do that? Well, in our query, we are going to use 
a wild card. Saying like star.com. So anything, doesn't matter, the star indicates a wild card, so it doesn't matter what's before the dot com, but it's got to be, it must end with dot com. So we're going to use wild cards for that. 8.5, which spreadsheet feature can be used to copy the results? Well, to copy the results of a formula from one spreadsheet to appear in another spreadsheet without copying the formula. How are we going to do that? We can do a paste special. And they don't want us to copy the formula. And with paste special, we can say paste the formula only. So I just want to show you. And let's do anything here. So you can see for yourself. So let's say I've got these values and yeah, I've said equals sum and I've done that. And if I want to copy that, I can go copy and over here, I'm going to go paste and you see paste special and I've got different options. I've got them up here as well. This says paste and there this says paste values only. That is with the formula. So if I click on this, you can see even when I click up there, double click on it, look at the formula bar. It is the value only, right? Nothing else. Okay, let's continue. 8.6, we're almost there. 8.6, the spreadsheet below indicates the marks of some of the learners. And we can see the marks over there, learners, raw marks, final mark. The marks in column B were adjusted to display the next whole number in column C. So you see 34.4. And it went up to 35, 50.6 50, 50 to 51. Which spreadsheet function was used to return the next whole number in column C? Well, you can see this is a rounding business. But 0.4 should actually round to 34. So they've used the round up feature, right? Round up. 8.6.2, the function displayed in the formula bar was used to give the result in cell C6. C6. Why is the result in cell C6 a 0? Let's look at this. Sum equals C2 to C6. So it's adding that to that to that to that to that. Okay? So it's, it's, it's adding all of that. Well... It's, it's showing a zero because we are having something called a circular reference. Um, and this is because C6 is actually part of the formula. That's why it's displaying a zero. Then the last one here, which spreadsheet function can be used to determine the number of learners listed in the spreadsheet? Let's see, number of learners listed in the spreadsheet. Well, if I'm counting that, I'm going to use a count function, right? I can use count, I can use count A, I can even use count if. Then I've got HTML code, so let's just look at this. HTML, HTML closed, body open, body closed. I've got a heading, I've got an unordered list. Here are my list items. Um, I've got an ordered list, list item, list item, okay, that, that all seems nice. And then they want me to illustrate how this web page would actually display. What would it look like? Have a look at this. This is what it will look like. We've got our shopping list as the heading. There's our shopping list as the heading. Then an unordered list with butter, eggs, and flour. And remember, an unordered list is going to have bullets. And then this is an ordered list, and it must start at the number 20. Is it starting at 20? Yes, an ordered list, 20, 21, 22. And there we see that. So you get one mark for the heading, done. One mark for the first unordered list. One mark for the second unordered, so, sorry, second ordered list. And one mark um, for the illustration over here. Okay. And folks, that is then how we get our marks for... Uh, question 8, and that brings to an end section B of 75 marks. 
Now let's get onto our last section, that's section C, and we're dealing with question number nine. And this is our integrated scenario. This is going to be worth the balance of the marks, which is, oh, sorry, they've got question 10 as well. So it's uh, section C is 50 marks, and then we've got question nine and question 10. It'll take us to that. So let's get started. Remember, they're talking about an integrated scenario. So they're integrating everything that we've learned so far into this particular scenario. The Representative Council of Learners, or the RCL of your school, plans to host a talent show to raise funds. You have been required to use your computer knowledge to assist the RCL. Right, so that's our scenario. Let's look now. 9.1, so this all pertains to 9.1 here. The school will use computers to manage the talent show. Okay. Complete the missing specifications of an entry-level computer. What is an entry-level computer? That's a computer with the basic specs, right? Just to be able to go into the internet, use Office a bit, do a couple of normal tasks, nothing with too much processing power or RAM and things like that. Right, so... Um, the specs of an entry-level computer that could be used by the RCL. Um, and then you need to write your answer. So a monitor, they're talking about a 17-inch LCD monitor. Look, even if it's a 14 or 15-inch, it's also fine. Um, this word, Celeron, what does this refer to? This refers to our CPU or processor. Then a storage device. What would that be? We could say hard drive. We could use an SSD, anything like that, right? Any one of those. And then what does this 802.11 refer to? That refers to my Wi-Fi standards, my Wi-Fi connectivity standards. Okay. So that's that done. Again, three marks, three answers. There we go. 9.1.2. Why would the RCL prefer to use tablets for the registration of participants in the talent show? Well, why do we use devices like this? Number one, for portability. Number two... Should there be any, and this is South Africa, should there be any load shedding? We are okay because it works on a battery. Okay, so any one of those. Then 9.1.3, one of the RCL members recommended that they use a voice recognition software for the registration. Give one motivation to support the suggestion and one motivation not to support it. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is um, when it comes to this, one motivation not to support it, well, it's expensive um, if you're going to be implementing something major. If you're going to be, let's say, using the tablet, um, you need to watch out for things like background noise. Um, the, the voice recognition, I know that software needs to be trained with your voice. So you just need to watch out for that. On the motivation side, well, it's faster to capture the data and there's no need for a mouse or keyboard or anything like that. You know, you just... Um, chat away and it does what it needs to so that's a motivation to support it and one not to then give two reasons why it would be better to use online storage for the fundraising data well maybe the fact that everyone can you know access it um, there's easier collaboration the data can be accessed from anywhere provided you have an internet connection um, better security though you don't have to secure it you put it up in the cloud and um, whoever you are going to be dealing with there, they keep it secure, they update it, they do all of that. So, you know, it just makes sense. Then 9.3, some participants complain that when they click on the link to the talent show website, it opens to an unexpected website. Okay, so now we need to be a little concerned with this. Um, because when we click on our website link and it takes us somewhere else, that sounds like things like click jacking. It sounds like farming it sounds like there could be malicious software that has infected that device and that link okay so again i'm just looking at that now i'm looking at the question give one reason why this occurs well i've given you three click checking farming a malware infection how can i avoid it in the future make sure i'm running an antivirus scan make sure my antivirus is updated you might not even have an antivirus software on that machine so you want to make sure you have that right 9.4 the worksheet uh, below let me just get this in front of me uh, the worksheet below summarizes ticket sales for the talent show for one night and there we can see 
the type of seat, the number of seats, the tickets sold, and the sales amount. Okay, these are all to do with 9.4. One, state two spreadsheet features that the RCL could use so that fewer errors are made when the data is captured. Well, we could use things like data validation. We could use conditional formatting. We could use a combo box from the developer tab um, so that we give people you know, only certain items to choose. We can use a date picker when it comes to the date. We can use freeze panes. There, there, are, there are a number of them. Okay, remember this is within Excel. This is spreadsheet features. The data of the ticket sales are stored in another worksheet. State two methods that were possibly used to display the number of tickets sold in column C other than the copy and paste. Now, when we're trying to extract data from a different worksheet into this particular one, we are using things like VLOOKUP. We're using HLOOKUP. We're using XLOOKUP. Um, we could possibly be importing the data. We could have, like with VLOOKUP, a function that works over two worksheets. So any of those um, would have been acceptable. 9.4.3 suggests two formatting changes. Formatting changes. Remember what formatting is? Changing things like merging cells, bold, italic, underline, currency, all these type of things. Formatting changes that can make the worksheet more user-friendly. Well, you can merge cells. If you look here, you can merge those cells over there. Maybe I want to make this a bit bigger. Maybe I want to change the color of these cells over here. Maybe I want to use the sales amount and say, well, let's change it to currency, right? I can change fonts, font sizes, anything like that, border thickness, the whole works. So those are just a few of the formatting changes. Then discuss two ways in which ICTs can be used to distribute programs, posters, tickets, and duty rosters for the talent show instead of printing them. Right, now we have a number of ways. We can send electronic tickets we can you know use our instant messaging we can use social media um we can use i mean things like uh, what the what the schools often use the the d6 you know apps and things like that qr codes we can email the tickets we can have a digital program all of those things any of them guys anything that that makes sense to basically use an, an online way of doing things or a digital way of doing it 9.6, after the talent show, the audience can use their smartphones to vote for the best act. Give two advantages of using an online form of vote. Well, if I do that, I'm going to get the results instantly. Um, the data capture is going to be immediate as well. I can put in functions. It is paperless. I can vote from anywhere. Um, there's, there's just so many to choose from. Then 9.7, trophies will be presented on the night of the talent show. Give two advantages of printing trophies with a 3D printer. Well, it's going to be cheaper. Uh, it's going to be easier. I can customize it to what I want. Okay. Then lastly, for question number nine, a member of the RCR will take photographs on the night of the talent show. State one possible problem when using a smartphone to take photographs. Hmm. Low light conditions. What about the battery? Um, what about things like you need to be closer? Remember, this is with your smartphone. You need to be, and it depends on which smartphone you, you're using. You need to be closer to the actual people in order to take the photos. Okay, so any of those. And that's question nine. Now let's move over to our very last question for this June 2022 paper from the DBE. We're continuing with another uh, integrated scenario. These are the last 25 marks of our paper. An educational organization offers online lessons and distance learning. So now we already need to think. Online lessons, we're going to be using things like Zoom, we're going to be needing cameras, we're going to be needing phones, microphones, you know, etc. All of those things. The organization will need ICTs to run smoothly. Okay. So given that, we need to also Remember, online lessons, we're going to be looking at things like our internet, our internet usage, our internet line, the speed, all those different things. Um, yeah, there's 
<laughs> there is there is a lot. Okay, so 10.1, the laptops for the organization need to be upgraded. Give a reason why the organization may not be able to upgrade the laptops. Well, the laptops might be too old. Maybe the new parts that we want to get are not compatible with the older, uh, older ones. And the hardware specs might not even allow for software to be upgraded. Think of your old phones. Even though they are still working, they can't use the latest versions of the operating system or when, um, like WhatsApp and things like that because um, the, the hardware is too old. Right? So that's something to think about. Then... 10.2, the internet connectivity is very important in an online education environment. Yeah, we know that. Um, so give the definition of the word or the term broadband. That is simply a high-speed internet connection that is always on. So a high-speed internet connection that's always on. Um, it's got wide bandwidth. Right? That's what they call it, broadband. 10.2.2, what is the unit of measurement for data transfer speed? It's going to be megabits per second. So you can put the MBPS, um, or you just write out the whole word, megabits per second. All right, last one there. What effect could throttling have? Okay, stop there. What does this mean? Throttling. When I throttle someone, that means I choke someone. I'm cutting off their air supply to the entire body. Right, So when I throttle an internet connection, it means I am limiting the speed on their line, not just for downloads or uploads, but for everything they are doing. Okay, so what effect could throttling have on users while learning online? Oh, you can uh, come up with one word, buffer. Right, buffering, lagging, um, you're going to take long to download resources. Um, sometimes you can't complete things on time because access to these online things might not work. So it can have a major effect on that. Right, 10.3. Uh, what did I say earlier about the, the video and things like that? Here we go. Give two disadvantages of video conferencing to deliver or access online lessons. Well, in order to do this properly, you need a decent speed on your internet line. So it does require a fast internet connection. It also consumes a lot of data if you are the one that is watching. And of course, we know there is a lack of face-to-face -face contact. Okay, so we, we, it's, It is different when you are in person to when you are online. Right. 10.4. We're moving along very nicely. 10.4. Any organization should be aware of privacy and security issues. So now we first process that. What are they talking about? What do they mean? Keeping my details private online while I'm still surfing the net. How do I stay secure online? You know, all of these things. 10.4.1, explain why a keylogger. Now we stop there. What is a keylogger? Well, a keylogger is a piece of malware that monitors your keystrokes on the keyboard. Explain why a keylogger, so that's a piece of software, why is it a threat to online privacy and security? I've already explained it now. Because this piece of software keeps track of your keystrokes, it can gain access to your usernames and passwords, and it can gain access generally to the information that you have. 10.4.2, give two advantages of two-factor or multi-factor authentication for the user. Well, extra security is the first one. Um, it just gives us more security. And then even if my password has been hacked, they still need the second step in order to gain access. Also, I will be alerted on attempts to access my account because I'm going to get a notification to say I need to you know, pop in that two-factor authentication and that's going to tell me, hang on, but somebody's busy with my account and they shouldn't be. Then 10.4.3, give two examples of web services that use two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. Two examples of web services that use that, well, maybe things like banking services, cloud storage, e-commerce sites, social media at times to get into your account, um, your your Google, your, uh, sorry, your, Google, your Gmail, things like that. Um, yeah, any of those examples. 
10.5. Point five, give two reasons why some students did not receive emails that were sent out. Well, it could be that their inbox is full. It could be that the email that was sent to them was flagged as spam. Maybe the service provider is down. Maybe the email address is incorrect. Maybe the person doesn't have data. Hmm. Okay, so any of those. 10.6, students will need to install add-ons to use the organization's software. Now, what is an add-on? Add-on is a piece of software that adds functionality to the browser. And lo and behold, what's this question? What's the benefit of an add-on? It adds functionality to the browser or the application. That is what an add-on is. So it adds on to what is already there. Can you give an example of one? Well, the fact with uh, some of your browsers, you have your ad blockers or pop-up blockers. Those are all examples of add-ons. Right, 10.7. Some lessons require augmented reality. What is augmented reality? Well, it's where we take on the physical world. So I always use the example of Pokemon Go. And you'll take your phone, you'll open the app, and it still shows you what's in front of you, the, the normal reality around you. And it overlays, it adds objects or graphics onto that within the real world. This is why virtual reality is completely different to it, where you are immersing yourself in a completely new environment. Right, so that's augmented reality. 10.8, give two advantages of online learning for the learner. Well, they can access this from anywhere, um, provided they have an internet connection, there's the flexibility in terms of learning. Um, they don't have to waste money traveling to the institutions. They can access whatever they need to on you know that online platform. Um, it's a safer learning environment. So there are a lot of different um, possible answers there as well. 10.9, the organization requires learners to submit their work as PDF files. Which application other than the PDF reader can teachers use to open PDF files? Well, I can also use my web browser, right? Um, it doesn't matter whether you said web browser, Google Chrome, uh, Microsoft Edge, whatever, but that is what you can use as well. Then 10.10, .10, we are wrapping it up now. A part of the organization's website does not display correctly. They want us to study the code and answer the question. So like in the previous one, let's, let's have an example. Let's have a look at this. HTML, closing HTML. Title tag, open. Here's my first problem. The title tag is not closed. Body tag is open. Body tag is closed. Image source online. Yeah, we can have alternate text as well. That's fine. Um, heading, table border. Okay, table tag, table tag. Row, row, data, row, row data data okay i have an idea now why does the title online courses not display in the web tab well because the tag is not closed properly that's it tag is not closed properly how many columns will there be in the first row of the table if the html code above is displayed in the web browser well what have i done here this code shows that there is one row with one item this one shows that there is a second row with two items. So they're asking me, how many columns will there be in the first row? One. If there was two entries, it'll be two. And then we finish up with 10.11. An image in another web page of the organization displays incorrectly. The file name and extension are correct in the HTML code, but only a part of the image displays in the browser. Suggest two ways to ensure that the image is fully visible well have they checked the dimensions of the picture in the tag maybe because you know we can add attributes to this right the size and the width um, what about maybe changing the view percentage on the browser uh, maybe they need to uh, resize sorry the original image as well so they would need to check the original image they would need to if they're saying that the coding is fine um, just see how that original image, if they maybe change it, um, how that will play. So you could mention, and I'm going to use it for in terms of marks here, you could say specify the dimensions of the picture. Um, so tell it what width and height it needs to be. 
you can change the viewer on the browser that they're using and also maybe resize the original image. Okay, folks, that brings us to the end of section C and also to the end of our June 2022 um, CAT grade 12 theory paper. This should now show you if you've done the 2021 paper, how things change within a year, but how the structure of things remain the same as well. And hopefully this is going to be um, a great help to you as you prepare now towards your prelims and towards the end of the year as well. I'll see you in another video, guys. Mm -hmm.